breathing underwater, being able to teleport yourself with a snap of a finger, talking to animals, what's the one superpower you wish you had? Hi, I'm Kathy, host of Salt Haven's podcast, Wild About Wildlife. In this episode, former Salt Haven volunteer Amber Marshall, who's also star of the CBC series Heartland, lets us in on the superpower she wishes she had. But first, we continue our conversation where we left it off in part two, and working with animals that just do not want to cooperate. On the set of Heartland, it's mainly horses. At Salt Haven, it's all kinds of wildlife. Brian, let's bring you in here for a little bit. And, uh, you know, uh, Amber was talking about how animals, when they're they're not being cooperative, how that is managed. How does that work at Salt Haven? Very different setting, obviously, but how does that work at, at Salt Haven when you're trying to administer some antibiotics to a particular patient and they just don't want to take them, for example? Yeah, well, you know, what Amber's saying is... is uh very true. There needs to be two-way communication with the animals and um, you need to give them a chance to say, no, I don't want to do that. And as Amber says, if you don't, if you don't honor that, somebody's going to get hurt. And, but it's the same thing when we're dealing with wildlife, you know, they have the same different standards, but they have the same uh, needs and to, to be recognized. And as Amber had mentioned earlier, their body language is so subtle. You know, a, a starling might blink his eye and the whole flock takes off type of thing, you know, and we have to be sensitive to those, uh, to that, that communication that they're giving us. And it, it's, it's a language that we, the onus is on us. We have to learn that because they may not learn our language too much or very well, but at the same time, those training sessions, as soon as we walk in the building, that training session starts because they may be already doing something to receive a reward and, uh, and we've missed it. And we don't know what they're thinking. Their mind may be someplace else by the time we actually sell in the, in the training process. But the, it, it's, it's really important that we don't try to give them human qualities especially in the rehabilitation process, because if they leave Salt Haven, they may be physically well, but if mentally they're attuned to the human precepts, then we have failed in our efforts to rehabilitate them and get them back into their natural environment. So what Amber's saying here is so important in the understanding of the animal and watching its body language and being attuned to that language in a way that you're going to be able to work effectively with them. The more the more tuned in you are to them, the more effective that session is going to be. And I'm sure Amber has seen that in, in the uh, production with, uh, with Heartland as well. It's funny that you say that, Brian, because that's one thing I always say is that humans think we're so smart, but yet we don't learn the language of the animals. We expect them to learn our language. It's like, oh, your, your dog doesn't sit when you tell it to. Like, your dog's dumb. It's like, okay, wait a minute here. We're, we're, we're missing the bigger picture. Can you understand when your dog needs to go out or is hungry or is injured or, you know, all these little things that we as the intelligent species should just be able to recognize. But so many times we don't even pay attention to that because we don't think that it's necessary or we think that we're above that. And that's one thing that always um, kind of drives me nuts about some humans. It's like, no, you need to you need to really watch and understand to be able to learn the communication of the animals around you. You can't just put all your beliefs and what you think onto your animal, expecting that you're going to have a good outcome. And that's one thing that I, I spend a lot of time doing is my meditation, so to speak. I don't ever do a formal type of meditation, but the more I look at it, it, it kind of is my own form of med meditation. But I go out at the end of a day and I sit on the fence and I just am a quiet observer. I watch the horses interact with one another. I watch the dogs interact with one another. I watch the cattle interact with one another. And then I watch them all mingle together too and see how that works. Because it's really interesting to me because a lot of times my horses, my cows, my chickens, my dogs, my cats are all in the same space together. And it's always interesting to see 
how the different dynamics shape and form and change and who's the boss and who's not the boss. And once you understand that, it allows you to be able to communicate a lot better. Because when I know who the boss of my horse herd is, all I have to do is get him on my side and then everybody else is on my side, right? Whereas if you go straight to the weakest horse in the herd, nobody else takes you seriously because you've just buddied up with the bottom of the pecking order. So it's, it's really, it's interesting to me how that translates into humans as well, because we are, we are very much the same. We have all the same ways that we understand structure and that, that herd or pack mentality. Humans do it too. We just don't necessarily realize that we are doing it. And so it kind of, it gives you um, better techniques to navigate through life with humans, <laughs> I guess, as well, because Absolutely. when you understand how those animals interact and the different structure that they have, then it allows you to help communicate with them in their language as well, which is really what it comes down to. So would that yeah. be your number one tip? Because a lot of people who will be listening or watching with, to this will will have pets at home. So would observation be your number one tip to try and be able to speak whatever your cat or dog or hamster or guinea pig is trying to tell you? A hundred percent. But I would go further and say observation out of the household, because a lot of times we have given our animals characteristics or even anxieties that we didn't even know came from us. But little things that we do, like one thing people always say when they come to my house, they're like, all of your animals are so relaxed. They're so calm. They're so, and I, like I have a border collie, I, I have high energy breeds, but it's, it's how and where you place your energy with your animals that creates their way of living. And a lot of times we come home and our dogs have been in the house all day waiting for us. And what's the first thing we do? We go, oh, I'm so excited to see you. I missed you so much. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> now my dogs just both got up and went, what's going on? But we, without knowing it, we are actually putting anxiety into our dogs. Because now our dogs go, what the heck just happened? Every time mom comes home, there's this burst of energy. And, and I have to meet that. I have to match that. And so they don't know, they really don't understand. And so now when you leave the house, they're sitting there all day waiting for that explosion. They're just going, mom's going to come through the door and it's going to be so exciting and this is crazy and I can't think. And that's when you get dogs that chew or that, you know, have all these anxious qualities to them because we've created that. And so one thing I've, I've just always done with my own animals is I, I maintain that quiet calm energy unless I need otherwise, right? If I don't need that, and which is very rarely that I need an animal to be worked up, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where I stay pretty calm. And when I come into the house after I haven't been home for a while, what do I do? I open the door. I let the dogs out. I don't even look at them, to be quite honest. I don't talk to them. I don't do anything. I let them out. They go do their business. And then when they come back in, I bend down, I give them the attention and I, and I calmly say, you know, like, oh, I missed you so much, like good dog, whatever. But I, that first initial interaction, I'm letting them enter the space again, instead of me bringing the energy in. So I'm letting them come back into the space in a calm matter. They've already gone to the bathroom. They've already done the things they need to do. And so now we can just enjoy each other. And there are times when I go outside and I get the dogs riled up and I, throw a toy. I'm like, go get him, go get him, run, 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 run. And they love it. And they do laps around the house and they're really into it. But that's at a place when they're allowed to bring that energy up. And it's not when I'm just entering. It's not when I'm just leaving. It's at a time when we've all been relaxed. We've been settled into our space and okay, now it's time to go play and be wild and have fun. That's your space. You're allowed to do that now. So I think for people that want to learn how to read their their own animals, especially if they're house pets, you need to be able to take them out of the house, let them interact with other animals or people, and observe how they are when you're not hands-on, right? Like if you have the opportunity to take your dog to a dog park or whatever it might be, if you want to just get together with friends and their dogs, observe them with each other. Because observing your dog with you is not going to tell you a lot about your dog. It's going to tell you a lot about you and how you maintain that relationship. 
which is good too. And if we recognize that, then that helps us go a long way. But I think the overall goal of watching your animals and learning their behaviors is best done when they're communicating in their own language with their own species. And then once we learn that, then we understand exactly where they're coming from, and then we can better communicate with our own animals. There are some people, you know, that pick up on this so very well, that very subtle speak, if you wish. And um, I mean, animals can feel what you're feeling. You walk in, you're in a bad mood. They feel that. And I know when we're training with our wildlife ambassadors, we have to just kind of check our own feelings. You know, that spirit speaking to spirit is one of the most powerful communications in the whole universe, I believe. And, And so we have to be careful where our mindset is before we go into a training session. So that two way communication that you're talking about, Amber, is so important when you're working with animals to be able to work with them effectively. And, uh, and, and it's a whole new world, you know, it's a world of different type of communication altogether than what you and I are used to. And, you know, we, we communicate vocally, but animals communicate very, very subtly. Somebody who's a, a tiger training, a a tiger trainer has to be really attuned to that type of language. Otherwise he can get hurt really bad. So yeah, it's an important part of that animal world. Yeah. And you're right there in and amongst it. Oh, I think not only does this relate to animals, but this communication, this subtle communication of reading energies and body language, that helps you in your everyday life with communicating with people uh, too. Absolutely. Because just like you said, you know, when you go into a training session, if you're not feeling yourself, you know, maybe there's something on your mind and your mind is elsewhere, that animal is going to pick up on that. Well, so is the person that you're talking to. But a lot of times we are really good as humans at just saying, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. We brush it off. But then we don't have a good, whatever it might be, a meeting or a communication or even, you know, a date or whatever you are experiencing in that moment. You're bringing all of that stuff that's clouding your mind into that appointment. And so I think for me, I've really learned too. It's like, you know what, if I'm really not feeling like it, I'm not going to go out with my friends because then I'm bringing that energy out. And I think a lot of times we're worried about disappointing people and, you know, oh, I said I was going to go out. I'm going to go out. But it can be simple as just saying, you know what, guys, I'm just not feeling it. I'm going to stay in tonight so that when you do go out, you're at your best self and you can spread that as opposed to spreading that little bit of negativity that you might not even realize you're doing. But it's just those clouded thoughts that you're bringing with you. And all of a sudden that creates a whole new dynamic. And that's that's when things misunderstandings happen. That's when you might get an argument with someone over something that you would not normally be concerned with. But carrying that energy into the situation is something that's never a good idea either. So it's I think for myself and the relationships I have, I've learned that if there are things that are weighing on my mind, I need to focus on that and deal with it first before I can go and just have a good night out with my friends. And I think that that's important for all people to recognize too, and to be able to sit down and say, you know what, I'm not feeling myself. How do I get to a point where I can get past this and be back in a, in a positive and and happy headspace? Mm -hmm. Some yeah, really and I, if good I could just add to that there. too, I was just going to say, if I could add to that, you know, it's really important that we're able to let ourselves be normal and natural in that way. Because sometimes we have a tendency to try to hide all of that. And when it comes to working with animals, especially it, as it is with people, it's really important that we're checking how we feel before we try to relate to others. Yeah, it's an important point. It's a good one. And a lot of times my meditation or the way that I can get over certain insecurities or negative energies that I have in my body is through animals. So that's kind of what I've learned over the years, too, is if I've had a really stressful day, you know, maybe things weren't going the way they were supposed to on set and everybody was anxious. I come home. I'm bringing that anxious energy home with me. I know which of my animals I can rely on to help bring me out of that. And I'm not going to go and try to train a young colt that doesn't know me with that energy, but I'm going to go to one of my older horses that's been around me forever. And I'm just going to go hang out with him and and he'll know, he'll be like, oh, she's not herself. 
that's okay. Like, I know, I know this relationship. I know what I can do to kind of bring her out of that. And same with my dogs and dogs are really good for that. And I think that's why people who have dogs know that if you're feeling down, your dog is your best medicine, right? Because they're always going to love you unconditionally and they they don't want to see you like that, but they recognize it. So a lot of times if I come home, I've had a stressful day, I get on my horse, I take my dog and we just go by ourselves. Like that's one of my favorite things to do is just go ride. And it's, I feel with every stride my horse takes, I just, that pressure is just dissipated, right? It's, it's almost like you're covering that ground and you're leaving all of your worries behind. And I think for people that don't have the opportunity to be around animals, try to find something in your life that can give you that release, give you that feeling. And some people find it through exercise, you know, just get out and go for a big long walk or go play a sport or go to the gym or whatever it might be for you. Find that and don't set it as as something that can wait, right? Like, you know, when you're feeling stressed, you know, and don't let it build up. You need to find that thing for you. And sometimes if it is with animals and a lot of people say, you know, I I wish I had animals in my life. I just don't have the time or I can't afford them, whatever it might be. But there's ways you can be around animals without having to have the financials or the time. You, you, could, you just need to make the time, right? And that could be volunteering at a, at a wildlife center or at an animal shelter or just going in and finding that release and being able to be around animals is some of the most calming experience you can have in life, I think. And mm-hmm. if, it's not, if it's not that for you, then find what it is. If it's exercise, if it's sports, if it's um, being with people that you love that you can just talk it through. I think everybody needs to find that for themselves and recognize it so that it doesn't build up and it doesn't turn into this spiral of, of something that then becomes unmanageable. Yeah, I think you were talking about how dogs provide that, can provide that respite. And I know cats often get a bad Mm -hmm. rap in that way. Oh, they're so independent. They determine when they're going to give love and, you know, cuddle and all of that. My cat, I don't know if maybe she was a dog in a previous life or something like that, but she can tell when I'm in a very horrible mood, she sticks so close and will come and cuddle extra and just, yeah, she, she taps into the energy, like you're saying that I'm, that I'm putting out. We had talked before the show that, Brian, you might have Shakar with you and Amber, you, you might have chickens or something nearby, but I don't know with your deep freeze, if that's even possible (laughs) right now or no. Yep. I I didn't bring, I usually have him really close because he's loud, my rooster, Um, but I couldn't keep him on the porch because it is minus 40 out there at the moment, but I can definitely go and grab him if, if you'd like to have a little, uh, some bird speak. Well, you know what we, <laughs> we Shakar is not here today. We we have sixty to seventy kilometer an hour winds here at uh, at Salt Haven. So <laughs> Shakar loves wind when he's flying, but uh, when it's just blowing when he's on the fist, he doesn't like it too much. But you know, one thing I was going to say to you, Amber, is that we were hoping to surprise you today with the presence of Mr. Campbell, one of your teachers that I know yes. that you really admire. And he's in Florida, as it turns out. Oh. So he wasn't able to be here, but he did send his regards and said, make sure you give Amber a virtual hug for me. And uh, his son, Nathan, now volunteers at Salt Haven as well. And I think the first time I met Nathan, he was about five years old. So I'm feeling really old because of him. But it's, <laughs> well, yeah. well, you and me both, because I remember when I was in grade 11 in Mr. Campbell's class and same thing, I think Nathan was just born. And, yeah. um, and now I had the chance, the opportunity to meet him when I came out to Salt Haven. And that's something we didn't really talk about, but yeah, after moving away from Ontario, I didn't really get the chance to keep in touch and see what you're doing and and all the amazing things that Salt Haven does. And so when I was there this past fall, I came out and you gave me a tour of the new space and the new facility, which was so amazing. And we talk about how how much impact you had just from that little shed. 
that little tiny shed that all of us volunteers were in feeding animals around the clock. And, and now to look at the facility, I'm really proud of you and everything that you've done. And it's just, it's such a remarkable community and group of people. And I'm really glad I was able to come out and, and spend some time there and, and understand just what goes on in something that's a little bigger than a, a 10 by 15 shed and to see how everybody has their roles and, and what they're doing. And it was, it was really inspiring for me to see. You know, we, we uh, kind of kept your, your uh, visit a bit of a secret so that we didn't have volunteers climbing over themselves to, <laughs> to get autographs. And uh, some of them after you had left were angry with me. They, Amber Marshall was here and you didn't tell us. <laughs> Well, next time I'm in town, I will come yeah. out and you can let me know that I'm going to be there <laughs> and uh, and we'll do a big group picture and something like that, because I would like to yeah. come and visit. Them. They would that love would that. Be awesome. <laughs> OK, so just a couple more things to, to touch on before we let you go, Amber, and a new venture for you. You ha you have a brick and mortar store now. Do you tell us about that? Something that I think is a little bit of a toxic trait of mine is I cannot be bored. <laughs> I cannot not be busy. And I say that because sometimes I take on a little more than I can chew and I say, oh, shoot, why did I do that? You know, sometimes it would be nice just to have some downtime. But um, I've always loved real estate. And one thing I've done on the side to balance out my acting time, because usually when I'm on Heartland, it's four to six months, depending on how many episodes we do. So that gives me a good chunk of time that I'm not filming. And typically I'm consumed with my animals and I definitely find ways to keep busy. But I've always enjoyed buying and selling homes and renting them out and kind of doing the landlord thing on the off season. And so I found this building that I just loved. It had so much charm. It's this cute little little house downtown, uh, Turner Valley. And I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to buy that and renovate it because it needed some TLC. It was in pretty rough shape. And so that was my winter project. I took it on. I completely gutted it. And with the help of some good friends, we were able to totally transform the space. And as I'm in there transforming the space, I started falling in love with it. And that's the number one rule about real estate. Never fall in love with your real estate. <laughs> and I did. And I said, wouldn't this be the cutest little store? And so not really giving it any full thought, I dove right in and started customizing it to be a country store. And I had so much fun doing it. And then all of a sudden it was the task of, oh, now I need people to manage and work in the store when I'm spending 14 to 16 hours a day on set. And summer came real fast to that year. And I went, okay, I got to hire people. I got to get product. I got to do all this stuff. And so it just was a bit of a whirlwind that first year. And it worked. I mean, we, we've got a great staff. We've got great products. And it just happened so quickly that now this is my second kind of winter off and being able to dive into it. And now I can sit back and say, I've got a really great team of people. We've got some really great products. Now, how do we want to venture out and find new things? And I really try to focus on some locally made stuff and so find new vendors. And um, it's just now it's turned into that that passion, that that project of love. But the first year I was shaking my head daily going, what did I get myself into? This is nuts. Like here I am, you know, working full time and trying to run a store. And I was, I'd be on my way home from set at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and I'd stop into the store and I'd be doing inventory and payroll and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just going, Amber, why do you do these things? So then I felt like I needed to balance a little better and have that structure. And now I have such a great team that I can trust and I let them take on a lot more responsibility so that when I am busy, I can not have to be as hands-on, which has been kind of wonderful, especially when I have animals to come home to. And I want to make sure that I'm kind of giving everybody some some attention as well as it just being, okay, no, I'm sorry, I'll see you on the weekend. Um, so that's been a really good learning experience for me as well, because I was never a very good delegator. I, I always like to do everything myself. And that's just been me from the very beginning. You know, I just want to, like just with our animals too, right? My husband's always like, oh, I'll go feed. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'll go feed. Like, I don't know. That's my job. And uh, just things where I need to be able to say, okay, honey, thank you. Right. Like it's, it's sometimes important for us to learn 
that we can give up a bit of responsibility. And I think for me, having animals, that's one of my biggest I don't know, setbacks, I guess, because I am a busy person and I want to do everything myself. I want to be the one that feeds and cleans and houses and does all that stuff with all of my critters. And sometimes it's just not possible. So I have sort of let the reins go a little bit, so to speak. And uh, I let Sean feed for me when I'm busy and, and things like that. But I still, I, I just want to do the things myself, especially when it comes to my animals, because I figure that's why I have them. They're they're part of me and, and I want to be the one responsible for them. And we should uh, mention the website. Your store has a website, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. So the store has just been one of those things that I, um, it's kind of a passion project and I really have enjoyed it. And my team is so great. And uh, we have now gone online. So we have all of our, our items, not all of them, most of them online. Um, so that's marshallscountrystore.com if you want to check that out. And it's it's just one of those things that's been a fun project. And now looking into the future, it's something that I can do after Heartland as well. Because we a lot of fans get very upset when I say the days after Heartland because, you know, we don't know when it's going to end. Um, but that is something that's important for me is to have a, something in place that I enjoy doing that I can do after the show's done as well. And so that was kind of my plan when I was starting the store I'm like you know what this is a really nice thing that I can do now and then I won't be bored when the show's done because I can take it on a little bit more hands on and and really dive into that yeah and and a key part of you the the some of the research I was doing ahead of time and is that you you're wanting to give back so um, I know in the past you've continued to to support Salt Haven through your different endeavors Talk about the importance of, of giving back, supporting the causes that are important to you. Well, like I said earlier, I feel like Salt Haven was a big part of my youth and it shaped me for who I am today. And I think it's so important to be able to, to recognize that and to continually to support organizations that are really helping people and animals, right? You know, we look at Salt Haven, it is, it's, its purpose is to help animals, but in doing so, it's also helping the people that are involved as well. So I think that that's one thing that really resonates with me are good organizations that are are doing good things for animals because anyone who knows me knows that that's my top one priority is I absolutely love animals and I want the best for them. But also having a community of people that are kind and, and good and, and being able to support that so that more people like myself can experience it is really important to me. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, Brian, is there anything that you wanted to say to, to Amber before we do our last round of quick, fun questions, if you're up for it, Amber? Yeah. <laughs> well, Amber, it was, it was absolutely wonderful to see you here this summer and uh, to be able to take you around and show you how Salt Haven has grown and the 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 feeling amongst the people is still the same and uh in fact some people refer to salt haven as being their second family type of thing and and that's that's good to know because it, we're perpetuating that feeling people working together here at, at salt haven the math is different you know one and one isn't two anymore it's 11 and that's because of that symbiotic relationship that we all have in working together to help those without a voice. So I'm extremely grateful that you were here and that you've agreed to do this podcast as busy as I know that you are with with your show and the store and the animals. And, and uh, it's just wonderful to be with you again. Thank you. Okay. So on that note, I have a list of questions. We'll do a quick round, quick fire round here. Amber, you're surrounded by animals. So what is your favorite animal? What animal do you most identify with? Oh, that one is hard because I think just top of my head, I would say dogs because dogs have always been with me my whole life. I usually always have a dog with me. I take my dog to work every day. There's always a dog around me. Those who know me from the show know that I love horses. I have a different relationship with horses than I do with dogs. Also love them. The animal that I feel that I uh, 
I guess would take on the most qualities of would be a cat. I I feel that I, a lot of times I'm very cat-like because when I want to be around people, I love people and I will just, you know, rub on every leg I can. (laughs) But when I don't, I find my quiet space and I hide and I just go into my space and I say, no, I'm, this is who I want to be today. And I also am very drawn to warm spaces. And I just feel like if I was to be any animal, I would be a cat. (laughs) What is your go-to guilty pleasure? I don't really have a guilty pleasure because I don't look at them as that. I have things that I do routinely, um, but I don't feel any guilt for them. Uh, Things like, you know, I I eat a lot of ice cream. That is, in some people's terms, a guilty pleasure, but I never find guilt in it. I just say, you know what, This this is deserving. After a long day, I was very physically active today. I feel like this is something that I can enjoy. And so maybe ice cream and maybe hiding as a cat when I should be doing things. And I just decide, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just going to take some time for myself. That could be seen as a guilty pleasure, but for me I just I think that it's it's deserved and I don't usually look at it like that. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Basic plain old chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be favorite. Right? I like, I like lots of flavors of chocolate or flavors of ice cream, but chocolate would be the top, I think. Yeah. If you could play any professional sport, what would it be? This is a hard one because I am not a sporty person at all. I was always (laughs) the person that tried to pretend I was sick during gym class. And, you know, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't that person. Now I've rode horses my whole life. So I've always been physically active with horses. So professional sport, I don't know. I could say like an Olympic rider or something like that, but Um, I'll just go with, I'll let the professionals handle that side of things. (laughs) We, We can probably guess the answer to this next question, but if you could do anything besides acting, what would it be? There you go. We touched on this a little bit. It would have to be something with animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a little girl, but I think that, that just my, my opinion on things have changed. And I think just being able to be around animals and good people is kind of my criteria for any type of, of job or anything that I'm going to do in my life. So yeah, animals, good people. We all have pet peeves. What's one of your biggest ones? It's funny because we, we did touch on this a little bit, um, but it's people that give their animals human characteristics and and feel like they're doing what's best for the animal without really understanding what's best for the animal so i think that that's the biggest thing where i'm like no if you're gonna if you want to love animals you need to understand animals and a lot of people just don't want to put in the time or they feel like they already know better so that would probably be my pet peeve so we would never see like ant Oh, reindeer antlers on, on your dog? No, no, that, that's happened for sure. That's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But that doesn't fall into that category. I think it's more on an emotional level. And yeah, like, I think that it means something different to everyone too. That's the thing is that we all have different communications with the animals and the people in our lives. And that directly relates back to who we are as people. So you can't expect everyone to have the same understanding of the animals and the humans around them because we just don't. But my pet peeve would be the people that just don't care to or don't think it's necessary to understand where their animals are coming from because they believe they already know. And last question, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? (laughs) I've thought about this question a lot and I feel like I would want to be able to fully communicate with animals. We talked about understanding animal behavior and, and the subtleties that they give us, but if I could actually speak or if my animals could speak English to me and I could fully understand what was going on, I think that would be the coolest superpower. I would rather that than flying or being able to breathe other water or anything like that. I think that in being able to have that open communication 
your possibilities are endless and you have so many friends. I just think that would be really cool. The gift awesome. of tongues, oh. so to speak. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> One more thing, too, we should mention, um, so Heartland, it's on CBC. Where can people catch it? Or if they need to binge watch a whole bunch of seasons, <laughs> where's the best place to find it? So we wrapped up filming season 17 back in the fall, and it has fully aired on CBC. Um, but if you want to catch up on that season or all previous seasons, you can find it on CBC's Gem app. Um, so you just download the app and you can view all of the seasons for free. And then, or you can pay and not have commercials, which is also a great thing. Perfect. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us today, Amber and Brian. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And honestly, I, I love being able to have these open communications because I think that there's, there's a connection between people who have animals in their lives and being able to talk about it it just it's it's one of those things that whatever you're passionate about you enjoy talking about and so it was a pleasure to speak with you guys today and that wraps up our conversation with former salt haven volunteer amber marshall thank you so much for tuning in your support means a lot if you haven't already subscribed to Wild About Wildlife, I encourage you to do so. We have some really interesting conversations coming up, including one where I speak with a researcher who is using artificial intelligence to study beavers. You won't want to miss that episode. You can find Wild About Wildlife on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube Music. <laughs>